My name is Sarah Watson, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's show, The Road to the Emancipation Proclamation. This is part of a series of our Looking for Lincoln conversations. Tonight, we will explore the events that brought Abraham Lincoln to live with his family at the soldier's home and the behind the scenes events that took place there, leading to Lincoln's issuing the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Ms. Erin Carlson Mast joined the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation as its president and CEO in January of 2021. Prior to serving as the foundation's leader, Erin was the CEO and executive director of President Lincoln's Cottage, a national monument in Washington, DC. If you'd like to have more information about the Looking for Lincoln conversations, you can visit the Looking for Lincoln Facebook page. Now, Aaron, it is my great pleasure to bring you on and welcome you and thank you for being tonight's speaker. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for joining us for this program on the road to the Emancipation Proclamation. When folks think of the Emancipation Proclamation, they tend to think of the one that Lincoln signed effective January 1st of 1863 not the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation issued on September 22nd of 1862, which started the 100-day countdown to January 1st. Nor do people tend to think about the places and people and experiences that may have influenced Lincoln's thinking that summer that he was developing the proclamation. So just as the Emancipation Proclamation grew out of the preliminary one, the preliminary one was itself part of a process building on drafts, and other important acts, large and small, in a very winding and uneven road to greater freedom in our country. That road included individual acts of courage, military action, and political challenges. A great example of this is what happened at Fort Monroe, when the courage of three men, Shepard Mallory, Frank Baker, and James Townsend, who escaped the Confederate master to reach Fort Monroe, gave General Butler an opportunity. He could turn them back over to the Confederate who claimed ownership of them, or he could refuse to do so and use the Confederacy's thinking against it by declaring the men contraband of war. That decision made by Butler in Virginia affected the landscape of Washington, D.C., Lincoln's thinking on emancipation, and touched his daily life in the very summer that Lincoln was developing and finally issued his preliminary emancipation. I've been really looking forward to sharing stories with you about those people, places, and experiences that were the setting, the backdrop really, for Lincoln developing the Emancipation Proclamation. And particularly, the place he lived for over a year total of his presidency, the place that created a daily routine that really expanded his horizons. The place I'm speaking about, the cradle of the Emancipation Proclamation, is what's historically been known as the Soldier's Home. It's a federal campus that was created in 1851 for retired and disabled veterans. It was a truly remarkable development, a government-owned place for retired soldiers to live out their lives. The idea of creating it actually came from England, where they have the Royal Hospital at Chelsea, and the two institutions share a special bond to this day. Remarkably, the campus, the soldiers' home, still serves this, largely the same purpose today as it did in Lincoln's time. Now it's called the Armed Forces Retirement Home, and a few hundred veterans live there today, about twice as many as lived there in Lincoln's time. The campus is inside the District of Columbia, just over two, two and a half miles north of the White House and the Capitol. And on the northernmost tip of what is a 250-acre campus in the middle of DC, sits a house that has been a home to several presidents, including Abraham Lincoln. It was declared a national monument in 2000, and it's now known as President Lincoln's Cottage. And though it is still sitting on this secure federal campus, it's open year round, and I'm sure my former colleagues there would love to welcome you. So to give you an idea here, this is the cottage right here in the middle. And then the building right here is actually where the hundreds of veterans live. So you can see that they were right next door to the Lincolns. Abraham Lincoln lived there for over a year total of his presidency. It was mostly in the summer and early autumn uh, with Mary and their youngest son, Tad, when Mary and Tad weren't vacationing farther north. 
Um, by at least one account, they were moving 19 cartloads of furnishings and personal effects out to the cottage. Uh, and when they were living there, Lincoln still had business to attend to at the White House, then known as the Executive Mansion downtown. So to give you an idea of where he was traveling from, um, here's a map of Washington, D.C. at the time. This is a, a wonderful map by Boschke. It was published right before the Civil War. Um, and it, you can see here that there's, it delineates between Washington City, which was the downtown area, and then the area further out, which is where the soldier's home was. So I know that this map can be a little hard to read, so I'm going to circle some things so that you get a sense of where the White House was, which is right here on the screen. It's labeled as the President's House. And then um, the soldier's home and the cottage are over out here, all the way up in more the rural estate portion of Washington, D.C. And so every day, Lincoln would make a daily commute um, when he was living out here from the soldier's home to the White House and back again. And based on our research, we believe that he went, you know, different routes every day, but by and large, this is the route that he would have taken um, on his way out of the city, up this road, which was then called the 7th Street Toll Road, is currently called Georgia Avenue, and then up this road, Rock Creek Church Road, which still exists out here today, and all the way up right here to the cottage. So this, not a very long trip, but he's moving 19 cartloads of furnishings and personal effects all the way out from the center of Washington City up here to the soldier's home. So you might ask, why on earth would Lincoln go to the trouble of relocating his family less than three miles away for a few months each year? Folks, Abraham Lincoln was choosing to be a commuter in Washington, D.C., rather than staying put in the White House. And having made that choice, what did his daily ride mean for the conversations he had, things he witnessed, the potential influence of those affected most by his decisions about the course of the war, course of freedom, that he was able to meet because of that daily commute? So there are a few reasons he could have chosen to move there. The first is that he was invited. We know that the Board of Commissioners at the Soldiers' Home started the tradition of inviting presidents to live on the campus um, with President Buchanan. And President Buchanan didn't spend a great deal of time there, but he wrote to his niece that he slept much better there. It's also the third highest area in Washington, D.C., and was considered a healthier climate. There were cool breezes that would roll up the hillside. It wasn't in the marshy, low-lying area where the White House was. So that's another reason it's considered a healthier climate than in downtown Washington. And we think Buchanan may have told the Lincolns about the place around the time of Lincoln's inauguration, because within three days of that event, both Abraham and Mary separately visited the soldiers' home. They intended to move there that summer, but the outbreak of the Civil War really postponed their plans. They did make move out there that next year, in 1862. And while the war was no less an issue, there was new urgency in having what Mary Lincoln referred to as a quieter place. Their son, Willie Lincoln, had tragically died in February of that year. Their youngest son, Tad, narrowly escaped the same fate, and they both likely got sick from tainted drinking water at the White House. As you can see here in this picture, which is actually from later on in the war, having soldiers and troops not only outside of the White House all over, but inside the White House was something that occurred. There were also livestock that was um, you know, along the waterways in the Washington Canal, which was a water source. So it was considered rather unhealthy and also not a place where there was exactly a lot of privacy. Bill Recall, I noted this one which was considered a healthier location, and particularly after one of their sons had died because of tainted drinking water, it was, you know, um, there were multiple reasons that could have been driving the Lincolns out there. The soldier's home was, after all, really built to be a place of respite for veterans. And so there was a chance that the Lincolns saw it as a place that could provide that for them. You certainly hear that in Mary Lincoln's language when she talks about them being in need of a quieter place. The White House, as you can see here, was a very public place, the people's house. Bands were playing, troops were drilling, um, you know, the traditional story about the lines of office seekers out the door. And being in the White House really meant that the Lincolns were in the spotlight to serve those who called on them seeking favors, 
Some have referred to it since um, as an iron cage or the bubble, but we could also think of it as a fishbowl, you know, comparatively little privacy or control over what happens around you, constantly having to be on all the time. So that gives us some more insight into another probable reason that they would want to move to the soldier's home, which provided uh, a comparative sense of privacy and calm. Uh, but having said that, in reality, the soldier's home was really no retreat. Living at the soldier's home meant that the Lincolns were adjacent to our first national cemetery for soldiers. Um, this is the predecessor of Arlington National Cemetery, where between 1861 and 1864, approximately 8,000 were buried. 1,000 of them were buried in that first summer the Lincolns were in residence. So think about that. Um, Lincoln moves out to this cottage He's thinking about um, the big decisions that he's making as commander-in-chief, as the president, and a thousand soldiers were buried in plain view, 200 yards from his first from his front door at the soldiers' home. Uh, on top of that, his immediate neighbors were retired veterans. Um, some of them disabled, some of them traumatized from their war years. The main dormitory was only about five, ten yards from the cottage. And then on the commute, Lincoln was passing army hospitals and caravans of wounded soldiers. Um, here's a view from the 1880s, but it's a wonderful depiction of some of the veterans at the soldiers' home. Um, and then here's a view of one of those nearby hospitals. And this is the, known as Harewood Hospital at the time. And then you can see this other flag in the background back here. And that building, that's the soldiers' home and the cottage right next to it in that little spot there. Um, so, really, Lincoln was seeing the human cost of war um, every day. It was really surrounding him, from the soldiers who were guarding him, to those who were in the hospitals, to the burials in the cemetery, and for those who survived, the veterans who were living right there at the soldiers' home. So, the commute was putting Lincoln, not only was living at the soldiers' home putting him, um, in a position to face that human cost, but the commute itself was because it was taking him right by things like these army hospitals and caravans of wounded soldiers being brought in from the front lines to those hospitals. And by at least one uh, account, we know that Lincoln um, would stop and speak to the soldiers about the experience that they were having on the front lines of war. On top of that, we know that when Lincoln moved out here to the soldiers' home, there were already potential plots and threats uh, against Lincoln and to his safety. People were writing to him, warning him that there were people who had horrible intentions to harm him in some way. And one of the most vivid descriptions um, of uh, these situations, oh, and this is also, this is one of the contraband camps that was along the way, a refugee camp, where formerly enslaved men, women, and children um, lived, and so Lincoln would have been seeing that on his daily commute as well. And we know from oral histories that he would stop um, and visit with people at these camps. Um, one of the most vivid descriptions uh, I've ever found of this situation comes from the diary of Josie Underwood in Kentucky. Um, and I highly re recommend it if you're interested in Civil War Diaries. Uh, it was edited by Nancy Barrett and published by the University Press of Kentucky several years ago. Underwood was not unlike Mary Lincoln, well-educated, outspoken, politically involved, from an influential family. Her father, Warner Underwood, was a politician, and he played a role in preventing Kentucky from seceding. So um, some of you might be familiar with that wonderful quote from Lincoln, I hope to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. And Warner Underwood was one of those people who maybe disagreed with Lincoln's um, politics or policies, uh, but was also not in favor of secession. Lincoln really needed folks like Warner Underwood, and he nominated Underwood to serve as the U.S. Consul to Glasgow, Scotland. Three days after that was confirmed, um, Underwood and his family came to visit the Lincolns at the soldier's home. So I'd like to share with you a vivid description of the Lincolns from Josie Underwood. And I'd like you to consider that this is exactly two days before Lincoln reveals his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet. So this is on July 20th, and Josie Underwood writes, 
the president and family were staying at the soldier's home. Pa got a carriage and invited Mrs. Etheridge and Miss Bell with me to dine with him to pay our respects to Mrs. Lincoln. I was most agreeably surprised when I met her. Instead of seeing the coarse, loud, common woman the papers had made her out to be, she was really a handsome woman, dressed in deep mourning, for her little boy, not long dead. Her conversation was agreeable, her manner gentle. Mr. Estridge thought, this owing to the sadness, which was very apparent, though she did not intrude upon us, only responding to cause very appropriate expressions of sympathy, and then tactfully passing on to other subjects. However, it was, I think, it a great shame to so misrepresent the president's wife or any other woman. Mr. Lincoln was not there when we called. As we returned to the city about sundown, there were no other people in sight on the road except a lone horseman we were meeting. He was on a tall, he was on a long-tailed black pony. The horse looked so small, galloping along, a high silk hat on his head, black cloth suit on, the long coattails flying behind him. Bob called our attention to him, saying, some farmer who has been in the hot city all day and is now eager to get home to supper and his family. So Miss Bell and I thought the man, and he looked it. As we met, Pa had the carriage stop. The man did the same, and Pa introduced us to Mr. Lincoln. He leaned over, shook hands with us, then slouched down on one side of the saddle, as any old farmer would do, as he talked for 10 or 15 minutes with us. Pa and Mr. Etheridge thought it a very imprudent and unwise risk for him in such a time of warfare and especial hatred of Mr. Lincoln himself for him to be riding unattended, unguarded, out on a lonely country road. And they called his attention to the dangers. Mr. Lincoln's smile expressed kindliness to all men and fear of none. As he said, he did not think anybody would hurt him that way. Lincoln in appearance certainly falls far short, though he is so long, of how a president should look. In fact, a very common looking man he is. But I must confess there is a kindliness in his face that does not fit a tyrant. Unfair man, I have been thinking. So, Josie's description, you know, this is very different than the White House, but he is putting himself face to face with um, all manner of people, he's really taking himself outside of that bubble. But as Josie's description shares, he's also putting himself in potential physical danger. Yet the soldier's home gave Lincoln opportunities to interact with people from all walks of life, with different points of view on the war, on slavery, and on freedom. Sometimes it was people he'd known for a long time, like Senator Ogle Browning from Illinois who visited him there that very summer. And the next morning, Browning saw Lincoln in his office at the White House, and he wrote that Lincoln had sketched out his, uh, his thoughts about a policy of emancipation. It also included people he was meeting for the first time, and that included many from D.C.'s free black population. Many people don't realize that approximately 80% of African-American residents in D.C. at the start of the Civil War were free, not enslaved. And with D.C. compensated emancipation in April 1862, and the Compensation Acts, the free population grew significantly. Some of them lived in contraband camps or refugee camps, and some of them, uh, house, these refugee camps were housing formerly enslaved men, women, and children. And one of those people was Mary Dines. And many years later, she recollected her time there uh, to John E. Washington, who wrote a, the book Naming Lincoln, which was recently republished and edited by Kate Mazur. And she recollected that while she was living in that camp, President Lincoln would stop to speak with people at the camp on his way from the soldier's home. She remembered him staying to watch a singing performance and said that President Lincoln shed a tear mid-song. She also recollected that Mrs. Lincoln contributed money and gifts to the older people in the camp. While her recollections did come many years later, we know that this behavior she was describing of Lincoln's was very consistent with contemporary information, including newspaper accounts about the Lincoln's. One of the questions might be, though, was Lincoln's policy of emancipation, were his views swayed in any way? Were they strengthened 
even by the influence of those he spoke with in this campus. And the truth is we may never know for sure. Lincoln didn't, to our knowledge, keep a diary where he explained the different influences on his thinking every day. But we gain a lot from the recollections of others and how we can piece those together with other contemporary accounts. We do know, however, that the Lincolns were removed personally by the situation of the newly freed, and they also gave personally. Elizabeth Keckley, an independent businesswoman and sought after dressmaker by the time the Lincolns arrived at the White House, was herself a survivor of enslavement. She was also a humanitarian. The same year that Lincoln is developing the Emancipation Proclamation, telling Horace really about the difference between his official duty um, and his personal wishes, that being his official duty to save the Union and his personal wish that all people everywhere could be free, Elizabeth Keckley helped found a charitable organization called the Contraband Relief Association. And her association raised funds to improve the conditions in those refugee camps, providing clothing, food, and bedding. And interestingly, Keckley asked Mrs. Lincoln to contribute, and Mary wrote a very persuasive letter to her husband, making the case that they should contribute to Elizabeth Keckley's cause. Now, not only were they hearing this um, from Elizabeth Keckley and hearing her appeal, but this was, as I mentioned, something that the Lincolns had firsthand experience with because they passed contraband camps in Washington, D.C. So Mary Lincoln, after having spoken with Elizabeth Keckley, writes to her husband, my dear husband, I wrote you on yesterday, yet omitted a very important item. Elizabeth Keckley, who is with me and is working for the Contraband Association of Washington, is authorized to collect anything, anything for them here that she can. She has been very unsuccessful. She says the immense number of contrabands in Washington are suffering intensely, many without bed covering and having to use any bits of carpeting to cover themselves. Many are dying of want. Out of the $1,000 fund deposited with you by General Corcoran, I have given her the privilege of investing $200. She is the most deeply grateful being I ever saw, and this sum, I am sure, will not object to being used in this way. The cause of humanity requires it. Please send check for $200. She will bring you on the bill. And I love this because Mary Lincoln is, is you know, outlining the need, but she's also starting with the assumption that this is just the right thing to do. I love that phrase, the cause of humanity requires it. And uh, the Lincolns not only contributed to the Contraband Relief Association, they were the single largest contributors in its first year. Uh, and by Elizabeth Peckley's account, they contributed every year. Lincoln's commute, um, in addition to passing contraband camps, was passing, as I mentioned, by temporary army hospitals. And we know the Lincolns visited them too and spent time with the soldiers. The location of the hospitals um, meant that Lincoln were, the Lincolns were passing them every day on their trips into the city and hearing firsthand uh, about what it was like fighting on the front lines of war. So Lincoln was coming face to face really with the consequences of those decisions he was making and hearing from people what their experiences were rather than simply relying on reports from his generals and his cabinet members. Um, and for the record, Secretary of War Stanton also lived at some point on the grounds of Soldier's Home, so he too was seeing the same things that Lincoln was. And um, it's important that he wasn't just seeing the soldier side of the equation, but as I mentioned, others throughout Washington, D.C., which was growing rapidly, uh, the population of D.C. swelled to well over 100,000 people by the end of the war, about 75% increase um, in the number of people in the city. And they were also seeing uh, the refugees and the people who were flooding to Washington to help with the war effort. And the timing of the preliminary emancipation proclamation really mattered because Lincoln first read his idea for preliminary emancipation proclamation to his cabinet all the way back in July of 1862, shortly after they moved to the soldiers' home, he was persuaded to wait for military victory or something close to that before issuing it. Um, and his official duty included war powers. So seeing firsthand um, what it meant for people who were newly freed, seeing firsthand the experience of the soldiers, the preliminary emancipation proclamation, I think of that many times as the coming together of Lincoln's official duty 
and his personal wish that all people could be free. It didn't achieve that, obviously, right off the bat. Lincoln understood there was more to um, be done. But he, he did make that point of differentiating between official duty and personal wishes so that it was clear that even when he was acting um, on the issue of emancipation, it was because uh, he was seeing the direct impact of the Union Army's effort, and he was seeing um, that the Emancipation Proclamation wasn't just uh, something that the cause of humanity called for, but could potentially help end the war as well. Lincoln um, maybe most famously made this point in differentiation in his August letter to Fortis Greeley, which is also a fascinating thing because this is such a famous letter, and a lot of times people turn to it to say, see, Lincoln didn't really care about emancipation, and yet we know, um, as I've shared, that Lincoln had already gone through uh, different drafts, he'd already presented it to his cabinet, so he was, he was, we know, thinking about this policy of emancipation and preparing to issue it, but he wanted people to understand that he's doing it um, for reasons that he considered just within his purview as president. And so to read some of those lines, he said, as to the policy I seem to be pursuing, as you say, this is the worst really, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. And then he goes on to say those, to write those words that we have probably all heard uh, you know, many times, I would save the union, I would save it the shortest way under the constitution. Um, but he ends that letter in a way that I think perfectly sums this up. He says, I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. And it was a month later, on September 22nd, following the victory of Antietam, that Abraham Lincoln issued the preliminary emancipation proclamation which was another significant step, far from the last step, on that road to freedom. It's an ultimatum, if you will, it was a threat, really. Uh, and so on January 1, with the Confederacy still in rebellion, he signs the final Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln knew that as an executive order, it could be reversed, and that a constitutional amendment would be needed to end slavery for good, at least end it legally and constitutionally. Uh, we know that just because something is illegal or unconstitutional doesn't mean it stops happening. But back at the soldier's home in the summer of 1864, um, this commitment to emancipation was tested. This was during his re-election campaign. And he was told by Henry Raymond, who, um, another Republican who was helping with this campaign, that friends in every state were saying the same thing. He said, the tide is setting strongly against us. And one wrote that if an election were held that day in Illinois, Lincoln would be beaten. And in Indiana, two of Lincoln's home states. And they continued that there were two issues that were really causing people to feel like they wouldn't vote for Lincoln and they would vote for the Copperhead Democrats. And it was the lack of military successes, the weariness that the war had drawn on so long, but also notably the impression in some minds, they said, the fear and suspicion in others that we are not to have peace in any event under this administration until slavery is abandoned. And of course, when they said slavery is abandoned, they meant the issue of slavery. They meant Lincoln's policy of emancipation. That Lincoln, that even if the Confederacy wanted to, was ready to throw down their arms um, and rejoin the Union, that they weren't going to do that if Lincoln held on to the issue of uh, the policy of emancipation. And many people feared that it would be a never ending war as a result. So he didn't say it in that moment, but in uh, in later conversations, some of which we know took place at the Silver Town, Lincoln said that he saw the, the, the idea of abandoning emancipation as a betrayal, not least of all to those brave US color troops who took up arms to fight the Union. Um, and just think about what Lincoln would have had to face every day on his daily commute. You know, he chose to live at the soldier's home. He found himself facing the consequences of his decisions every single day. Um, that shows a tremendous amount of accountability, but he also saw these as his fellow citizens who could give him new perspectives and new understanding of what was happening. But his action tells us that the
fact that he was willing to go through that every day, even though it was very hard, um, not as hard as the struggles of the people who were around him, but he felt this burden. Uh, his action tells us that this place meant something to him, because in spite of all the risks, the personal danger, the human cost of war that he faced every day, he kept choosing to go out there. Um, and even being out there wasn't enough of a, a retreat, if you will. Um, two visitors came to him and were startled by how he looked and said that he should go away for a few weeks and take a vacation. And he responded to them that it would do him no good, that his thoughts and his solicitude for this great country followed him wherever he goes. So thankfully, the tide did turn, and with it, public sentiment to enough of an extent that Lincoln carried the day in 1864 and continued to push forward on ending slavery. The Lincolns last visited the cottage of the soldier's home the day before his assassination of Ford's leader. And this is a picture of the cottage um, from Mary Todd Lincoln's family album. The Lincolns had every intention of returning for what it would have been a completely different summer at the soldier's home in 1865. Uh, but it didn't happen because of his assassination. And it was about a year later that Mary Lincoln wrote to a friend of hers, um, reflecting on how dearly she loved the soldier's home and how she now felt so far removed from it, um, so far removed from her family's time there and so broken hearted. So I would like to end by reading some excerpts from an essay by the poet Walt Whitman, who was one of the many people who flooded into the city to try to help the war effort. Um, as a nurse and or to find lost or injured loved ones, as Whitman did with his brother George. Many of you are probably familiar with Whitman's famous poems, Oh Captain, My Captain, or When Lilacs Last in the Joy Earn Bloomed. But fewer people are familiar with an essay Whitman wrote that appeared in Specimen Days. Uh, Walt Whitman lived for a time along the his commute route, so he was in a position to see him regularly. And I'd like to read three excerpts of it for you because I think it reveals a lot about Lincoln and how much this daily commute from the soldiers into the White House, this road to the cradle of the Emancipation Proclamation, um, was about the people and the journey so much more than it was about the destinations. Whitman starts, I see the president almost every day as I happen to live where he passes to or from his lodgings out of town. He never sleeps at the White House during the hot season, but has quarters at a healthy location some three miles north of the city, the Soldier's Home, a United States military establishment. I saw him this morning about eight and a half, coming into business, riding on Vermont Avenue near Hell Street. He always has a company of 25 or 30 cavalry with sabers drawn and held upright over their shoulders. They say this guard was against his personal wish, but he let his counselors have their way. The party makes no great show in uniform or horses. Mr. Lincoln on the saddle generally rides a good-sized, easy-going gray horse, is dressed in plain black, somewhat rusty and dusty, wears his black stiff hat, and looks about as ordinary in attire as the commonest man. And then he continues, I see very plainly Abraham Lincoln's dark brown face with the deep cut lines, the eyes always to me with a deep, latent sadness in the expression. We have got so that we exchange vows in very cordial ones. And Whitman ends it with, they passed me once very close, and I saw the president in his face fully, as they were moving slowly. And his look, though abstracted, happened to be directed steadily in my eye. He bowed and smiled, but far beneath his smile, I noticed while the expression I alluded to, none of the artists or pictures have caught the deep, though subtle and indirect expression this man's face. There is something else there. One of the great portrait painters of two or three centuries ago has made it. I've always loved that phrase from Walt Whitman where he says there is something else there. And I think that's what so many of us in the field who are doing the research and what all of you who are interested in it and, and looking for Lincoln as our uh, host tonight, their name implies there's more there. There's more to understand about this president who is both historic and in some ways surprisingly modern. Um, there's so much more to learn and there's so much more um, to this seemingly simple man. So thank you so much for joining us tonight.
Thanks, Erin, so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heather Wickens, and I'm the program manager for Looking for Lincoln. It is now time to take your questions. So if you would please type them in the chat um, in Facebook or YouTube, um, we will get to answering them. But Erin, I want to start off by asking you a question because what you've just been talking about is really what else there is to, to learn about Lincoln. And so could you answer the question, um, why you think that Lincoln is still relevant for us to be studying in the 21st century? Hmm. I think first and foremost, he, the actions he took as president have, are still consequential to us today. Um, I believe very much in the unbroken arc of history. And, uh, you know, I think that there is so much about Lincoln's behavior as what I would call a principled leader. Um, you might not agree with his principles, but he was very principled in the decisions he made. Um, he was very rational in the decisions he made. And he demonstrated a level of accountability that I think people are hungry for with their elected officials to this day. Mm -hmm. um, he also just, and I think this is not only why Abraham Lincoln is relevant to us in the United States, but why he's often pointed to as an example in other countries around the world with different systems of government, different um, economic models, is that he represents that potential of someone who can rise up the ladder of society and achieve the highest office um, in the country. And I, I think that people are hungry to understand how someone was able to achieve that um, and learn from it. Yes, it's, it, it, is, it is very remarkable in that in that light of of lincoln's life and how he was able to do we just yeah. it's like it's just phenomenal because you're like wow he grew up in a log cabin and he you know he didn't have a year of education but he wrote the eman well you know he wrote the emancipation proclamation he wrote the gettysburg address kids yeah. still learn you know it's just like and very self-deprecating through it all you know um yeah lincoln was the first person to say well like yeah i need notes because i'm not as good at this or yeah i need you know extra time and reading because i was largely self-taught um and I, I think you know he was also not one to say sort of what's good for the goose is good for the gander he recognized the education that he lacked was really important for democracy and he was very pro-education um, and refer to it as one of the most important subjects we can be engaged in. Um, so I, I think that he combined that sort of vision for how we create the more perfect union, understanding that was not achievable in any one lifetime, and that different generations would, um, you know, redefine that for themselves, what that meant. Yes. In some ways, Lincoln is very forward thinking for his time. You know, I think and that's partly why I think he's still so rebel, relevant to us today is that he saw things that how they could eventually be, but how they were not quite able to be at the time in which he lived. Yeah. And acknowledge that with his observations. Yeah. 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 Which is impressive considering he never, you know, went to school really, like, you know, just the fact that his brain was, was like that. Okay. So I have a question. Um, and this one popped up because when you were reading one account, per, you, 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 you referenced some primary sources. And when you were reading, reading the Josie Underwood account, you said Lincoln was traveling by himself. But then when we get to the Walt Whitman account, yeah. he's traveling under guard. So at what point, I mean, was it like sometimes he traveled under guard and other times he didn't? Like at what point did they say, you have to have someone <laughs> with you? So that was this, that was that first summer. So he started out riding by himself and then it was his, I mean, they, you know, Whitman even references the fact that they say he didn't, and this was against his wishes, but that his advisors insisted on it. It was Stanton, Secretary of War Stanton, General McClellan, as much as we can, you know, people like to make fun of General McClellan. And um, he, he saw the danger and had felt like it was his duty to, um, to assign a guard to uh, President Lincoln. And Mary Lincoln, um, you know, also was, you know, understood the danger to her family and her husband as well. So he was he was compelled. There are some really amusing stories of him because he really did resist it, getting up and taking off without them. And then oh. they to 
they would realize that they would have to jump on their horses and chase down after Lincoln because he was, you know, I mean, they didn't want to get in trouble. Obviously, they have the optics of that would have been hilarious. Right, 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 right. So, um, but one of the beautiful things is that uh, Lincoln develops a real bond with these soldiers who are camp on the ground, and they become like big brothers to Tad Lincoln. Um, you know, and he really does. He'll take coffee and a plate of beans with them, you know, on the grounds. And so as much as they were sort of escaping a little bit of that at the White House, for security reasons, they they did have cavalry and uh, and uh, infantry there at the soldiers' home as well. Uh, but they, you know, those soldiers wrote home to their families in, um, there was some from Western Pennsylvania, there was a, a guard from Ohio at one point, and a lot of those letters home really give you these beautiful glimpses into Lincoln's time there at the soldier's home and how those soldiers thought of Lincoln, um, including, you know, they all felt sort of like they weren't, uh, they weren't seeing action, like, a, like maybe they expected to when they signed up to fight for the Union Army, um, and Lincoln tells some funny story, you know, uh, I think it has to do with why pigs have a curly tail. It was some funny, like, you know, analogy. That yeah. it just, God has a plan. <laughs> it's, you know, it's it's all for a reason. And um, But yeah, you know, I mean, the, the first season the Lincolns are living there, so the first week the guard is on duty, they catch someone climbing up the tower at the soldier's home who is thought to have been a Confederate spy. Because I mentioned that it's the third highest area. From the top of that tower, the castle looking building in that first mm -hmm. image I showed, you can see all of Washington, D.C., which means you can see where all the encampments are. You can see everything. So it was a strategically important position. So even outside of Lincoln's safety, there were military reasons and you know security reasons for them to have uh, soldiers stationed out there. So in that end, and this is just a follow-up, so he had a guard traveling, but what, did they also, like, then provide security around, like, the, not around the house, but, like, on the yeah. grounds because of that? Essentially, yes. They were, it was, uh, the cavalry would escort him, and then the other, um, the soldiers would stay there on the grounds. So there is a, there are a couple slightly different accounts, but enough that it corroborates that, that we believe it happened, that there is an incident where Lincoln's hat is shot off his head while he's riding back. And um, the guard goes off down the road and supposedly, reportedly finds it with the bullet hole through the room. And supposedly Lincoln, you know, according to the stories, Lincoln says, Oh, I'm sure it was just some foolish gunner with an ear shot not meant for me. Um, by the way, that's <laughs> Thomas is Lincoln. You know, I mean, let's not tell the wife. Yes, yeah. Thomas is Lincoln. Yeah. So, um, there, like I said, there are a couple different accounts of that story, but you know, even what you get from that Josie Underwood story, and you know, John Hay, one of Lincoln's secretaries, talks about some of the letters they wrote. It's very clear that people understand that this is not the safest thing for Lincoln to be doing. Um, so while he never says, I love this soldier's home so much, it's just so important for me to be out there, his actions are telling us that, and Mary Lincoln writes about that. Just because it was kind of his way to get away from the pressures of what yes. he was going through, but at the same time, he had all those experiences while he was <laughs> traveling, so. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. This We've always struggled with, with thinking through that, so it's like he... He gets out of the White House, but it's actually a more dangerous place. He's right next to the cemetery. He's past, you know, I mean, it's not really, it gives him physical distance, maybe, and it gives him perspective, literally and figuratively, that he didn't have at the White House. Um, well, and I, I think it was interesting tonight how you brought up the conversations that he would, because Lincoln, as we all know, was a conversationalist. Yeah. And he, he's just riding by, and these people aren't necessarily wanting anything from him. It's not like when he's standing in his office and there's like a line of people out the door asking for this or that, or they want this, or they want his support, or they want this position. So he's riding and being 
Lincoln and being the conversationalist, I see him like, as you described, stopping and talking to these people and caring and wanting to know their perspectives. But, you know, and, and you're right, if he'd stayed in his little bubble in the White House, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have had those perspectives. But still, like, it's not like when you go to a secluded place and no one's got access to you. Right. This isn't like, uh, yeah, it's not that kind of retreat where he's able to sort of, you know, you know, some mountain lodge that no one can get to and no one's going to go to. And, you know, uh, people did find their way out there. And there are many wonderful stories that are told at, the, at President Lincoln's Cottage about those people who find him out there. But, um, you know, one of my favorite stories of two California women who were visiting and they uh, they are trying to see Lincoln, but he was busy, and so they they wander over to the cemetery, and they're out there, and he comes up, um, you know, upon them in the cemetery. He recites some lines of poetry, uh, fitting for the situation, and then he, I'm pretty sure it's this. It's, I know he does this. He catches a ride with them back downtown. <laughs> you know, he'll hitch a ride with visitors. Like, oh, you're going my way. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ride with you downtown. So. We forget how accessible our, you know, elected leaders were at that time. But then it's what happened to Lincoln that starts to. Yes. And then there's security like security barriers, which you can't begrudge, but it is, you know, I mean, it's. The access that they, that the common, even just the common person off the street yes. could walk in to, you know, to the White House is just. Walk right up to him. Yeah. Just just walk right in and, and talk to the president. I mean, yes. yeah. it's 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 crazy. That's just not how we view it today. Well, We're so removed. From, that's not even like we are so removed from that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Or even when you think about him sort of like riding on his horse and just sort of slouching, you know, like Josie Underwood talked about and just, you know, the fact that he would stop and chat with anyone. He clearly recognized um, Warner Underwood. Uh, but you compare that with the motorcades of today, where it's, you know, lots of security, just, you know, point A to point B. It's not about the journey along the way. It's not about who you're meeting and interacting with by chance. That was the amazing thing, how much chance was playing into Lincoln's every single day. By the right. Out there. Well, and even, you know, as a historian, you know, like, there's lots of things that happened on that journey that we will never know about because nobody wrote it down or maybe they yeah. told their family member but oh i saw lincoln and he was doing this today and and so those people that lived and saw him like walt whitman and many others like like it was just part of their routine and and like now you're like wow everybody knows what the president's going to be doing like he between yeah. this time and this time lincoln's gonna be <laughs> yeah. riding by well, and thank goodness that someone that's such a master of words like Walt Whitman was there, like happened to, his boarding house just happened to be there. Right. Like, yeah, I mean, he could have wound up anywhere else in the city, but he happened to land in the spot that gave him a front row seat to Lincoln's daily commute. And despite this sort of being like well-known and um, something that was part of daily life to the point where a lot of people don't comment on it because it was just understood that Lincoln went out there. Yes. And President Hayes and Arthur did afterwards. So, I mean, it wasn't just Buchanan and Lincoln. It, it continued to be a tradition. And yet it faded from popular memory uh, for years. And it really had to be resurrected when it was declared a national monument and reopened. And I think that is actually a cautionary tale um, about preservation. Because when you restrict, I mean, it was not the Armed Forces Retirement Home's purpose to operate a museum for Lincoln, a nonprofit partner had to come in and do that. Mm -hmm. um, they were still using the building, but they weren't interpreting it as, you know, as the Lincoln's home. They knew its importance. They had portraits of Lincoln hanging in there. They cared about it. The veterans cared about it. Um, they're the ones who got people together to say, we need to make this a, you know, a museum. Um, but because it was restricted and people couldn't go there, right? Because right. People couldn't visit. The, it faded from collective memory in our country. So it was fun to be part of the process of, you know, um, the research and the, the studies and the restoration to, to really resurrect that part of history. Because it's so, it changes the story when you know that Lincoln was out there and who he was meeting with and who he was seeing every day when you think about what he was developing with. Yes.
And and since you brought it up, and because I'm sure there are some people listening on this broadcast who are not familiar with the soldier's home and, and what is now President Lincoln's cottage, could you share? I know I know that's not what you do now, but I know you're very invested in it. Could you share a little bit about it in case people wanted, it, like, if they're going to be going to DC and want to plan a trip? Because I've been there and it's a pretty amazing experience. And I think other people who are lovers of Lincoln, like myself, would would enjoy going. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, first, I would say that folks can check out LincolnCottage.org, which is their um, website. And, um, you know, COVID times makes this a little different, but normally it's open 362 days a year um, because public access, especially after so many years of not having it, that was something that we really prioritized. And you'll get a guided tour that is very conversational, um, that takes you through the house. There are no velvet ropes. Um, there is period appropriate furniture that you can sit in so that you can, you know, have the experience of being one of Lincoln's visitors. And there are a lot of these wonderful quotes and stories that are pulled in throughout the tour experience, and there are exhibits. But then I also just have to say the experience of being out there at the Soldier's Home, it doesn't feel like your normal part of Washington, D.C. I mean, I, I described it, but it is a 250-acre campus just right there in the middle of Washington, D.C. with the predecessor and sister cemetery, Arlington National Cemetery, right there. And it's also only two miles or a mile and a half south of Fort Stevens, where Lincoln came under enemy fire when Confederate General Jubal Early attacked Washington, D.C. The Lincolns were evacuated to the White House, but they went back out there anyway. <laughs> the person next to Lincoln gets shot down. The next day, he and Mary Lincoln both go out there. Um, and so it's not just President Lincoln's cottage that you can go and see and experience. But you're really going to see part of Washington, D.C. that is off the beaten path. And it's just, I, I think it's wonderful to be out in that part of the district, too, because it's not the sort of very, you know, I mean, I love the National Mall as well. But if you really want to understand a little bit more about um, just how much history pops up around every single corner in Washington, heading out to the Soldier's Home to see President Lincoln's Cottage and then going to the cemetery and checking out Fort Stevens. Is, is definitely worth the time and effort. Okay, I have one final question as we wrap up tonight. So how do you think Lincoln's experiences on that road and even his time at the soldier's home when he, he got that kind of respite, how do you think that time away impacted his presidency? Mm -hmm. You know, I know this I was, is not this is a difficult question. So it, it is, but there are there are a couple stories. You know, I mean, over the years, there were people who reached out to us who were really trying to figure, like, almost crack a code for what it is that makes people really effective leaders. And I emphasize that physical distance and perspective because that's part of it. So there's one, um, I think Daniel Patrick Forrester is his name, and he wrote this book about considering the power of reflective thinking, this idea that you need time away to reflect, to be effective in your actions and decisions. And I do think that the cottage provided that for Lincoln, that it was even the commute itself, like in that, you know, he's riding home on this country road alone at night. Think about just what was running through his head while he was on that road, you know, processing the events that happened that day. Um, and then uh, separately, there's actually a book called Digital Minimalism. Uh, that's a best-selling book. And they wanted to talk to us too, because, you know, Lincoln was very keen on things like the telegraph and new technology that would be able to get him information faster and more accurately. Um, but Still, again, it, it's not that he wasn't receiving messages, telegraph messages out of the soldier's home from the, from the presidential guard. But here again, it did, it was a change of scenery, a change of venue, a place that was more their own, where they had a little bit more privacy. And time and again, when you read visitor accounts of seeing Lincoln there, you, you know, you could tell that sometimes they're coming across Lincoln and he's just lost in his own thoughts. Um, and I think being able to detach in that way mm -hmm. was critical to him being as effective and thinking as expansively and differently and creatively as he did. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Erin. This has been a absolutely lovely conversation. Um, you're you're welcome. It was a lot of fun. So um, I'd like to say goodnight to our audience, and we will hope you will join us for our next broadcast. Good evening.